earth needs watering. So we're here to praise the Lord in spirit and in truth. Amen. Amen. We want to stand for this first selection to wake us up as we praise the God of heaven. I woke up this morning with my mind and it is staying on deep. Yes, you know I woke up this morning with my mind and it was staying on the Lord. Yes, you know I And it was stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 And I am singing and praying with my mind. And it is stayed on Jesus. Yes, and I am singing and praying with my mind. And it is. Yes, and I am singing and praying with my mind, and it is staying on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 You know I can't hate my neighbor with my mind, and it is staying on Jesus. Yes, you know I can't hate my neighbor with my mind, and it is stayed on the Lord. Yes, you know I can't hate my neighbor with my mind, and it is stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 morning. I don't know if you all caught it, but the booth wanted us to go another verse there, Darrell. <laughs> yeah, we, we got our mind staying on Jesus. Uh, if you're a guest this morning, thank you for entrusting us with your walk towards God today. I thank you for that, and I want to just say thank you. Uh, a couple things. If you need communion passed out to you, go ahead and raise your hand. Someone will be around for that. Raise it high so they can see you. Another thing, if you're a guest, someone really wants to write you a card this week. So if you can fill out one of these, if there's one nearby, I had to search one out, so I apologize for that. But go ahead and fill it out and put it in the box. Those are in the back also. Uh, maybe to continue a, a trend that's been started with something new and exciting, Jacob Tanner, that young man was baptized this last week out at camp. Yeah. We know, if you know John and Jeanette, they love attention, so just give it to them. Yeah, just go love on them uh, and bring that in. And there have been a lot of kids the last few weeks baptized out of camp. Uh, we have a, a job and a role to do to bring them closer to God on their walk. I came across a verse this week that I want to share with you. I pray that we're a church that makes known to each other the path of life. We're in God's presence. There is fullness of joy. At his right hand sits Jesus. And those pleasures are forevermore. I pray that we are leading everyone closer to that. That's my iteration of Psalm 1611. Let's go to God as we pray, as we get together. God, we thank you for this time we have set aside. I pray that we truly are that church that Mike challenges us so much. We're on a train going to heaven, God, and we just hope we all hop on. I pray that we're leading each of our guests here towards heaven, God, and towards you. I pray we're a family that looks at our brother and helps them along in the midst of their struggles. I pray we're a family that wants to be closer to you. Thank you for this time you've given us, God. In your name we pray, amen.
these next couple selection is um, just a little talk with Jesus. I just want to do a scriptural reference here on this one. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Probably all familiar with this one. It says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find it. Knock, and it will be opened to you. So we have that just a little talk with Jesus, our prayer time. And God answers us openly. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus makes me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Come on and let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faith. And he will answer by and by When you feel a little prayerful yearning As your heart and your heaven is turning You will find a little talk with Jesus Makes it right, it makes it all right Sometimes my path seems dream Without a ray of cheer and then the cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. The mist of sin may rise and hide the starry skies. But just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Come on and let us. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. When you feel the prayerful yearning, as your heart and heaven is turning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears But Jesus is a friend who washes day and night I go to him in prayer He knows my every care And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right Now let us Come on and let us He will hear our faintest cry And he will answer by and by When you feel a little breath for yearning As your heart and your heaven is turning You will find a little talk with Jesus Makes it right He makes it right Next election, victory in Jesus. So we walk according to God's word, faithfully. We will see the crown of heaven, crown of glory that does not perish. Let's stand for this next election, please. I heard an old, old story, how Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary, to save a wretch like me, I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoned me. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, oh, oh victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me. He loved me ere I knew him, and all 
If for the prize we have striven after our labors are over, rest to our souls will be given on the eternal shore. We're singing about the home of the soul. Yeah. 
So today it's a pleasure for us to come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper and as we all know, uh, the night before Jesus was taken away, they had the Last Supper and he holds a cup and he goes, guys, you need to do this and remember me. And he's not telling his followers to remember crucifixion. He's telling them to remember what's in his heart and what he's doing for them. Why would he not tell them to remember being crucified? Well, you have to remember, at the time of Jesus, Israel was under Roman law. And if you defied Rome, they crushed you violently. And in the year 4, there was a rebellion in Israel. And when the rebellion was over, 2,000 people were crucified at one time. And you can imagine naked people being nailed to crosses, lining the highways, and you had to walk past them as they're screaming out in pain and dying. This is not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is always about what's in your heart, what is your commitment. And the Bible is full of foreshadowing. If we go back to the father of our faith, Abraham, he had to wait until he was 100 years old before he was given the son he was promised. And it's a long time to wait. And after this young man is 10, 12 years old, God says, all right, take your boy, go up on the hill, take some wood, slit his throat, take his blood, pour it on the altar, set him on fire and make a sacrifice to me. And Abraham's got to be thinking, this is crazy. I waited all this time, I got my boy. What am I going to do? And if we flip forward several thousand years, we see God the Father and his son going through the same thing. So after the Lord's Supper is over, Jesus goes into the garden and he's praying to his dad. And his prayer is quite simple. You know, dad, can, can, can you take this away from me? I, I can't do this. And the stress of all of this is really great on Jesus. And it's only recorded in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus sweats blood. And this is a medical condition. People undergoing great stress go through this. And you can imagine the conversation that goes back and forth between Jesus and his dad. And you can imagine the father saying, look, Jesus, we planned this. These people are too stupid to do this right. The only one who can do this is you. And we talked about this. This is our plan. And when that prayer is over, Jesus knows this is what he's got to do. And he's ready. And the beauty of all of this is that the Father doesn't leave him alone. He empowers him with so much power that when they come to get him, they say, where's this Jesus guy? And when he turns to them and says, I am he, there's so much power comes out of him that he blows the guys away and they get knocked back 12, 15 feet. And at that point, Jesus must know his father is with him. So now he goes through 18 or 20 hours of abuse. And then he goes through Roman sport. They beat him a couple of times, kick him, spit on him, stick a crown on him. They're having fun. I'm like, oh, another Jewish Messiah, another Jewish king. Who cares? Let's crucify him, get it over with. And when Jesus is on the cross, we see the extent of his sacrifice for us. For the first time in 50 bazillion years, Jesus and his father are separated. 
The whole time people have been coming to Jesus. Who are you? What are you doing? He goes, me and my dad, we are one and the same. We've got one mind. We've got one heart. We've got one purpose. And now Jesus is on the cross. And the sin of the world is going to come down on him. And God our Father is holy. He is pure. There can be no sin in his presence. So he and the Holy Spirit have to walk away from Jesus. And it's that point that you hear the anguish in Jesus' voice when he goes, Dad, where are you? Dad, why have you left me here? Why have you abandoned me? And this is the extent of the sacrifice that Jesus has done. And then he dies. And thankfully, the anger of God is restrained. It's limited to an earthquake and to the ripping of the curtain inside the Holy of Holies in the Jewish temple. And you can imagine that at this point, the anger of God must have been so great, he could have blown away the whole planet, sort of Star Wars style. But he restrains it. And thankfully, we can be saved by the act of Jesus. So when Jesus says 2,000 years ago, Remember this. Remember me. We're remembering what was in his heart that made him commit to doing this and doing it so well. So as we take the bread and we think about the sacrifice of Jesus, remember what he's done for us. And it's a heart commitment that he's asking us to do again. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your great plan. For without it, we cannot approach you we cannot be close to you. We thank you for the commitment of Jesus and we pray for the commitment in our hearts to do what he has asked us to do and that is to remember what he has done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we also know that when dinner was over, Jesus took a cup of wine and he shared it with his disciples and tells them to drink of this cup and remember him as well. And the significance of this stems from all the animal sacrifices that have been given to God over the past several thousand years. They take an animal, slit its throat, take the blood and pour it over the altar and then burn the animal as a sacrifice to God. In this case, we have the blood of Jesus that is poured over us. And the beauty of this is that we are washed clean so that there is no sin in us and we can stand in the presence of the Father. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord God, for blessing us and for the blood of Jesus that washes us and makes us whole, makes us pure so that we can stand in your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time in our service, uh, we have an opportunity to take up a collection and um, the collection boxes are placed at the back of the church. And I'd just like to share a story about a friend of mine. This is a lady who lives in Wichita, and she has the faith of a child. And it's a faith that I have never seen in anyone. And there's a story I know about her where she saw a homeless lady in the street who had no shoes. And she stopped her car and went to the lady and said, what is your shoe size? And gave her the shoe size, and then she drove home and took a really expensive pair of shoes out of her closet that was the right size. She drove back to this lady, and on the way, she bought her a drink as well because it was a hot day. She gave this lady her shoes, 
She gave her a drink, and the, she sat with her in the street and prayed with her. I've never seen such a beautiful faith and such a beautiful gift from the heart to someone as what I saw in my friend in Wichita. And as we give back to God, I ask that he will bless each heart so that he will take care of you and you will honor God with your gift and your kindness because we have money that's going towards the church and it's going towards people who need money, people who need to hear the word of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time where we can give to you. This is a money collection. We pray that you will bless each person as they give, and we pray that you will bless the elders who oversee the distribution of this money so that people are strengthened physically and spiritually by hearing your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, it's time for Junior Church. Let's stand up and sing children ages three through six out. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face you should be shown. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, shout hooray. If you're happy and you know we shout hooray. If you're happy and you know it, then your face is sure to show it. If you're happy and you know we shout hooray. If you're happy and you know we stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know we stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know we stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know we do all three, <laughs> hooray! If you're happy and you know we do all three, <laughs> hooray! I missed one. If you're happy and you know, then your face will surely show. If you're happy and you know we do all three, <laughs> hooray! You may be seated. Oh, wait a minute, I got a song to sing, I'm sorry. Oh, scripture reading. I'm going to stay with the program. <laughs> <clears throat> the scripture reading today is from 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Uh, quickly, before we sing this next election, I want to share a little bit here. Um, so this week was one, last week was one of those weeks where I had to really, really, you know, find myself and move myself out the way. Because remember the old saying, me, myself, and I? So I had to move the myself part of me out the way so that the I am God part of me can reign. Then I could find out the true me, what God wants me to be. So that's a work in progress. Um, so this next selection, Restore My Spirit, is is I, I thought was appropriate uh, for this particular time in the worship service. And can we please stand for this election? <clears throat> Restore my spirit, Lord, I need. Restore my heart is weary. Please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Stir my desire to work in your soul. 
my courage, Lord, it needs restored. My cup is empty, refill it, dear Lord. Replace all doubts and fear with faith so bold. Renew my love, renew my faith, oh, restore my soul. I think I was supposed to turn that on. <laughs> um, I'm not real comfortable doing this sermons, and as you can tell, I don't even have all the mechanics worked out, but it's been years since I did one, so I hope you all will bear with me. When I told my wife that I was going to be doing a sermon, her only comment was, oh boy. <laughs> and she's entirely right. My mom always wanted me to be a preacher. But as we're going to soon find out, moms can be wrong. <laughs> so anyway, I've, I've learned that whatever I do, though, when I am nervous and the best course of me, and I've found this in any phase of my life, is to go to God in prayer. And that always seems to help calm me and, and bring me the peace that I need to communicate better. So if you'd bow with me. Father, we... we uh, we all strive to be the kind of people that you want us to be, and, and we have so much love in this congregation here. And Father, we just ask you to be with us and help us to grow in love for one another. And, and we just ask that uh, your spirit will dwell in each one of us as we, we gather together here and, uh, and as we, we consider the things from your scriptures. We know that sometimes we, we are human and that we fall short and that we, we start thinking of ourselves more than we should. And we just ask you to be with us and help us to always have the kind of love that Jesus had for us. When he came, he died on that cross for us. Help us to, to always be remembering your love for us that you sent Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, somewhere I have another doodad here. I believe... Buried in the bottom of my pocket, apparently. So this uh, we'll uh, kind of start off with, and this is just to set the context a little bit. Lucy and Linus are arguing about TV program they want to watch, which I know has never happens anymore since everyone seems to be able to stream exactly what they want, so you don't have to come to any kind of uh, <laughs> a conflict because of that anyway. And we find other things to argue about in families. Anyway, Linus decides to throw a little Bible knowledge at Lucy. As St. Paul wrote in his first epistle to the Corinthians, love is patient, love is kind, love is envious, is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. So Lucy asks, what about wallops? And Linus says, wallops? And then, and of course, Lucy gives him a good wallop. And then Lucy tells him, I noticed that St. Paul didn't say anything about wallops. And that's kind of the way I think sometimes we approach Scripture. Uh, we are always looking for some way that uh, if it's not addressed, then, uh, you know, very, real directly and kind of hit us over the head with it, then it must be uh, what we, it's okay to do whatever we are really doing. We try to uh, find the ways to uh, get our way. And that's really... Uh, losing track of what we really should be doing. And so today I'm going to talk about something I think we all need know. It's something I think we, most of us all know already, but I think it's something we need to be reminded of, and I know that I need to, because sometimes you kind of fall into forgetting about God, and then next thing you know, who are you thinking about? You're thinking about yourself and what I like. So Jesus desired our unity. And the disciples, uh, I think, uh, just last week, uh, the, when uh, Brent was doing his uh, sermon, I think he kind of also referred to this scripture, but it's in Luke 22, 24 through 26. 
A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. And Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. And this was not very long bef- before this. He had uh, washed their feet. He had washed the feet of the person that was going to betray him. He washed the feet of the one that was going to deny him. He washed the feet of all those disciples who were going to flee from him when he, when he uh, was arrested. And he told them that they, they uh, at that time, that they should just learn to serve one another just as he had served them. And then later that day, Jesus again happened to uh, show them how... Uh, to serve, and he served even to uh, the very end. So Jesus prays that he was arrested for the disciples. So uh, going a little bit further, John 17, 6 through 19, I have revealed you to those whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all that you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be the one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so the scripture would be fulfilled. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that you may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've given them your word. And the world has hated them, for they they are not of this world any more than I am of this world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, and they too may be truly sanctified." So this was the prayer that Jesus offered for the apostles. And we could spend a lot of time on these verses and barely touch on all the lessons that we could pull from this. But the thing I want to kind of uh, concentrate right now on is the verse, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. And, and Jesus wanted us to be unified. And it wasn't a unification of... Uh, well, I need to think exactly like Lyle does or, or, or I don't need to, to uh, think just the way Durrell does. I just need to have the love that we have a common purpose and, and in that way we're, we're going to be together. And that's the kind of uh, unity that Jesus wants us to have and wants us to be showing the world. Then in the last part of his prayer, he prays for us. John 17, 20 through 26. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in, one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and I have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them 
and that I myself may be in them. Jesus wants us to be one, just as he and the Father are one. And more, most importantly, that we would have the love that God had for his Son for one another. That is at the center of all the gospel that Jesus brought to us. It is all bound up with love. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Sometimes it's easy to love, and sometimes it's more difficult, which now leads us to the problems that they had at the church in Corinth. And if you want to turn to uh, First Corinthians chapter 3, we'll probably be spending most of our time there from now on. Corinth was a cosmopolitan harbor city. It had over a half a million people that were Roman people, Greek people, Jewish people, and a large number of the people were poor or slaves. The city was known as a cultural center that was famous for its arts. It was known for its brass work and architecture. It was a place to be. But the temples practiced prostitution, and there was a great deal of immorality in the city. The church was established there, however, was made up of mostly poor people, but they were people from the community, and, and just like any time when you're in a culture, you kind of be, get influenced by it without even knowing it. The church had a basic issue. They started arguing about who was the better leader. Some were saying that they would follow Paul, and some were saying they'd follow uh, Paulus. And I think some of them even were, were talking possibly about being Cephas Christians. And, and this is very upsetting to Paul because uh, when he baptized them, that was not what uh, he was teaching them, and that was not the, the message of the gospel when the church was first established there in Corinth. So he's giving them some very stern words in this chapter to get them back on the track that God wants them to be on. In 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 9, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you were ready, you're still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, and you are not mere human beings, what after all is Paulus? What is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord is assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. The church was acting very worldly, and, uh, and it wasn't spiritually they were concerned about at all. So Paul was addressing them as people that were still worldly. And so do you think he got their attention when he basically was calling them babies? They were being worldly, and they started arguing and being jealous. They should be showing growth spiritually. They should not still be stuck on milk. Sometimes it's hard to give up on the worldly things. Sometimes I think we, we try to straddle the fence. So... Sometimes we want to do what we want to do and also do what God wants to do and think we can accomplish both. Um, the only way that's going to work is not by straddling the fence. There is no fence like that. And I think uh, most of us have tried it one time or another, but eventually you have to make that commitment. You, you can't uh, be doing what you want to do and also be doing what God wants to do. You have to align yourself to what God wants and not what you want. Um, a lot of times we start setting up camps like they did here. And it probably sounded something like this. Paul got us started, but Apollos did the real work. Well, I think we wouldn't be here for what Paul did 
Well, I think Paul explains God much better than Paul ever did. What about Peter? He really got it all started with his Pentecostal sermon. There's just all kinds of arguments. If you start looking at it in worldly terms, we kind of get to concentrating on the, the way the message is delivered instead of what the message actually is. And so um, we sometimes do the same thing here. We, we, we start fixating on, wow, that really sounds good. Or if it's a song leader, that really sounds good. But um, I don't think God's listening to that person. He's listening to what we hear. He's listening to what our hearts are doing when we sing songs. So we need to try to get out of that mode of thinking. And so that's one of the things that I think as we start listening and, and having preachers come in and, and try out, that we need to keep in mind that uh, we shouldn't be praying necessarily for the best preacher, but the preacher that God wants to be here and, and who will be effective and help us to grow. So he planted the seed, and Apollos watered it, is what Paul wrote. But the real foundation is Jesus Christ, and he talks about the church as God's field, God's building. Often yielding is going to take sacrifice, and sometimes we have to use the opportunity to show our, our sacrificial love for our brothers and sisters. But in verses 10 through 15, this is what Paul writes. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. And someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold or silver or costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will come will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So we are God's filled. We are his building. Paul built on that foundation, and eventually... On Judgment Day, it'll find out if we've been laying the right work on top of the foundation that was built by Jesus. 16, 17. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Um, we are the temple of God. Um, all genuine believers have a spirit of God dwelling in them. Christ promised to always be in the midst of two or three that are gathered in his name. That's in Matthew eighteen twenty, And wherever God is, there is his temple, Romans 8, 14 through 16. I think that's a concept sometimes we, we, we kind of lose. We kind of talk. Talk about the Spirit of God indwelling each of us individually. But also God does talk about when we're gathered together, that also is a temple for God. And, he, and he's going to be, Jesus is going to be there in our midst as we're gathered right here. So there are consequences that he, that, uh, he has for defiling the temple. How do we defile the temperature? defile the temp temple. <laughs> if anyone injures or corrupts or destroys the church by false doctrine, God will destroy that person. There's language that should really get our attention. God does not want any of us to cause one of his little ones to stumble. So sometimes we get the attitude that, and I've heard it from people, not in the congregation, but out in the world, but the congregation, but the, the conversation usually goes like, well, does God really say that? And then when you kind of affirm and show them that God really does say that, they go, well, if that's God, then I don't want anything to do with him. And there are people like that. And so 
those are the ones that, especially if they decide that they're in the church for some other reason, that uh, you have to kind of watch out for that, that they are going to be ones that are going to uh, be directed towards those that intentionally oppose the truth. So they will be destroyed. The erring, mistaken person, and if you look at verses 10 through 15, I think it's somewhat talking about that, but you can study that on your own, but um, you will be treated more leniently, that you, you will certainly uh, understand that God does want what's best for us as a congregation, as a church, so that we can continue to grow in the love that's really what we're all about. 1 Corinthians 8, 18 through 20 says, Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. If your standards lined up with the world's standards, then it's probably time we became a fool. Um, the world's definition of wisdom is foolishness to God. Um, worldly wisdom tends to be very self-centered, exalts itself, and when our hearts are not submitted to God, we'll harbor pride, jealousy, selfish ambitions, and use our wisdom against others. God's word calls such wisdom earthly, unspiritual, demonic, that's all from James chapter 3, verse 15. Jesus points out that Satan fosters such thinking and gets people to focus on things from a human point of view, not from God's. He doesn't want us to be thinking about God. He wants us to be thinking about us. Worldly wisdom teaches warped views. And so you end up with uh, warped views on beauty and success and marriage and parenting and sexuality and, and morality and it, if it's followed to its end, it always leads to evil and disorder. It's uh, often, I think, uh, very confusing when you try to understand even where the world's coming from when they start going down some of the roads they do as far as all the things that were listed here. And uh, I think that we need to know if there's a lot of confusion involved. It's probably not from God. God does... Uh, have a very easy, simple thing to understand, and it's not confusing. If we're getting confused, it's probably coming from Satan. We should avoid boasting about human leaders. We should be glad that they have the gifts they have. So we will have people that are very good, and I, I think I always heard it referred to as the gift of the gab, but <laughs> if uh, they have those gifts, we should be thankful that God has given them those gifts and remember that they all came from God. And when we run into trouble is when we start thinking that uh, they are the ones that we should always listen to and not necessarily what God has to tell us. More about true spiritual wisdom, we can choose life over death. We can choose a future with God. We are of Christ and Christ is of God. Wisdom from the Lord guides the believer to live in an upright, virtuous, and well-pleasing manner. The wise person is committed to God, devoted to his will, and obedient to his word. Truly wise people are humble because they are aware of the depth of their ignorance. The more they learn, the more they realize how little they really know. In Greek thought, humility was a negative trait that suggested weakness and a lack of worth or dignity. Jesus, however, made humility the cornerstone of Christian character. 1 Corinthians 3, 21 through 23. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Christ died on the cross to save us and to establish his church. He knew that we needed each other. He knew that we would need the love that he had taught us and showed us. 
It was and is a love that transcends the world. And because of the love that Jesus has for us, and because of that, he bore the cross for us. And he wants us to know the same love and show the same love to our brothers and sisters. And this kind of lends us quite a bit to, we've talked a lot about what we have to yield, that we have to yield what we want and decide to follow completely, completely follow God. And God's desire is for you to know him and love him more than this world. So if you've come to the conclusion that Jesus is the son of God, that you must trust him as the Lord, master of your life, you must turn from your sins and repent and be baptized just as they did on the day of Pentecost when the church was first born in Acts 2. Perhaps you have needs or desire prayers with things that you're wrestling with in this world. We want to be a people that serve and show the love of Jesus. Whatever you need, and we want to be there for you, there are elders that will be in the back, and we're ready to pray with you or serve you in whatever your needs are as we sing this song. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His great design? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed, are you washed in the blood, in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb, of the Lamb, are you not mixed, spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you each moment in the crucified Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed, are you washed in the blood, in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb, of the Lamb? Are you garment, spotless are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? <clears throat> when the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white, pure and white in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for those mansions bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Yes, are you Once again for uh, making the decision to be here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we are honored that you have uh, chosen to be here also with us today, and we hope you'll stay around a bit 
after service so we can get to know you a little better. Uh, just one announcement this morning, uh, as reported in the email update on Friday, uh, Megan Patrick had a spinal tap a week ago, uh, Sunday last week, and a stent was put in her head on Thursday, which led to some issues that put her back in the ICU for a short time. But on Friday, she was doing better, but still having some vision problems. And uh, talking with Chuck this morning, Megan is home, home now, and uh, she's slowly regaining some vision. But we need to keep uh, Megan in our prayers and pray for her uh, full recovery. And thank you, Bart, for the lesson this morning. And I'm not sure your mom was right. I think you, maybe you got it. <laughs> As we continue the series on unity, uh, it's important to remember that unity is not just a man-made concept. And without God, unity is often next to impossible. God honoring unity is only possible through the work of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 133 reads how wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. There are many references to unity in scripture, but we learn from them that unity is something to be desired and something to work for. But unity by itself isn't enough. If I remember correctly, all of mankind was united at one point in history for a common goal, and that was to build a physical tower to heaven. It had nothing to do with honoring God, and he wasn't pleased. So we know that man is capable of unifying around an evil goal as well as a good one. So how do we find the unity that pleases God? In John 17, 22, Jesus said, I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know, will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. In 2 Chronicles 30, verse 12, it also says, it says, also in Judah, the hand of God was on, it, on the people to give them unity of mind to carry out what the king and his officials had ordered following the word of the Lord. And finally, in Romans 15, Paul writes, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one heart and mouth you will glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, did you notice there that the unity in each of these scriptures was something God was giving? The unity God gives doesn't mean we're all going to think alike on every subject. It's having a common bond that links us together starting with faith in Jesus as the Son of God, by allowing him to dwell in us and asking God to give us the endurance and encouragement to let his spirit fill our hearts and mouths in a way that glorifies God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear God, our Father, we are thankful for this opportunity to come before you today. We know that when we meet, that you are here with us and that you hear our prayers. And at this time, we want to continue to pray for Megan. We're thankful for the improvements she's made and we pray that she will soon, uh, well, she is released now, but we pray that she will have a full recovery and get back to her normal life. And Father, as we continue our study on unity, help us to always remember that though we come from many different backgrounds, we have a common link in your son, Jesus, who came to earth as a man and died on the cross to carry our sins as a part of your perfect plan. Fill each of us with your spirit so we can attain the kind of unity that honors you and draws others to your saving power here at Southwest. Father, we continue to pray for our minister search. We know you have a plan for Southwest and we pray for guidance and wisdom as we try to carry out that plan. And Father, we have so many blessings in our lives. We thank you for the rain this morning. We thank you that we live in a free country where we can come together and worship you as the one and only true God. It's through our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
I stand for the last selection, closing selection. So anywhere is home as long as Christ is there. So as we leave this place, we still have the Spirit of God with us. So let's sing this song to ourselves and to each other. <clears throat> Earthly wealth, wealth, and fame and fame may never come to me. And a palace is fair. Here my may never be. But let but let come. What God would make if Christ for me doth care? Cause anywhere, anywhere is home, sweet home. If he is only there, anywhere, anywhere is home, sweet. Let come and go, what may come, what may any, any way I chance to roam. He keeps me all the way each day, so, so, so for my dear master said, my cross I'll meet thee there. Cause any, anywhere is home, sweet home. If Christ my Lord is home, be Often about and dream. Sad within, within, without, wherever I may go. So I press along, still looking up in prayer for his home. If Christ is only there, anywhere, anywhere is home, sweet home. Let come and go, what may come, what may any, anywhere I roam. He keeps me. For so for my dear master, say my cross I'll be bear. Cause any anywhere is home, sweet home. If Christ my Lord is there, I will lay. Till I am called away, till the morn shall dawn of that eternal day, looking on to him who keeps me. His care, yes, anywhere, anywhere, is home, sweet home. If Christ my Lord is there, anywhere, is home, sweet home. Let come and go, what may come. 
what may anywhere, anywhere I roam. He keeps me all the way each day. So for so for my dear Master, say my cross I'll be leaving. Yes, any. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for allowing us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we, uh, we pray that you continue to watch over us and keep us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do not to give thanks and ask it all that every heart say, Amen. amen.